If you have been asking if healing is real, stick around and find out that healing is for real. And we don't mean maybe. My name is Tony. And I am Zin. And we are two witnesses and representatives of the miraculous gospel of healing. Boom. <laughs> and bam. Boom and bam. And welcome everyone to, the, to another episode of the Gospel of the Gospel of Healing Podcast or the Miraculous Gospel of Healing Podcast. I am Zim and I'm Tony Myers. Right. And we are if you listen to our, even our, our our promo as well as the last episode, which we actually had the opportunity to listen to Tony's awesome testimony. You know, that we have actually teamed up together to do this podcast to bring healing to you via podcast, just as Jesus took healing wherever he went. And so last week, um, Tony, we spoke about your, your awesome testimony, and I, to say the least, was blown away. <laughs> yeah, and even to actually see, as I mentioned last week, how the your, your experience it resonates so much with what we have actually been able to this to rediscover let's say rediscover because it was pretty much lost over the last few centuries rediscovered through the through our research at the international institute of hematology how do you feel about the um, the testimony last in in the last episode i feel that it was it was a good testimony um I love the points that you brought out into it, right? Because they were good; they were true. Amen. They were true, good points. Uh, so, I feel like that was probably one of the favorite, my favorite testimonies that I've given. Amen, amen. And I trust that it actually helps everybody who hears it. And I, I actually am very confident that people who hear it. They're going to be inspired to get up and be healed themselves. And I will say this. I've gotten several emails um, of people. I don't know if they if they listened to that mm -hmm. specific one. Okay. Because this is under my ministry's email. But okay. there's been uh, quite a few emails that were different people. First time contacting me. Nice. And they had heard my testimony, didn't say from where. Okay. Um, but so I am believing that people are getting healed. Amen. You, That's Jesus. what we're talking about. That is what we're talking about. That All right. So about. I want to hear your testimony because I know bits and pieces. Right. But that's all I know is bits and pieces. All right. Well, so my testimony begins in an old house. <laughs> well, I just, I just joke it. Um, so to fit to fit my testimony in just you know fifty to sixty minutes is going to be is, is for the entire thing is actually going to be impossible so we would actually just highlight the main things in particular that that caused some some serious changes so for those of you who actually never heard my testimony and those listening i actually grew up in a predominantly pentecostal home right and when i was a child i grew up in what i would refer to as a spiritually hostile environment and what i mean by that is i lived in a home where my parents, because it was actually a family home, and I had parents in particular, I, even though I went to a Catholic school, a Catholic primary school, learned the whole Catholic way of, of doing things, my parents were predominantly Pentecostal. I had family that were Baptist, but not Baptist like in the United States, more the African-style Baptist that they incorporate the gospel in, into it. I say they incorporate it because it's a full African experience. 
and um i also had living at home with us were was my was my aunt at the time who was charismatic catholic but amongst us in particular and my step great grandfather who was also an advanced member of one of those lodges and he apparently did things like animal sacrifices and so on so when i was a child i actually had contact with things that people would call paranormal experiences right i actually had those had those experiences that i would not get into here today now, very rarely do i speak about it because I speak about the paranormal experiences because once i actually came to understand what we understand now all of those things stopped Right, so I very rarely speak about it because I don't want people to think that it is something that is formidable, because it is not. It's not formidable at all. It may seem like that when you're experiencing it, but it is not. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, throughout my my childhood, now I remember when I was just before I even started to learn the Bible, because my father taught taught us. To, to start studying the Bible when we were somewhere between five and ten, we began to, to start to read the Bible and learn Bible stories and so on. And just before that, I had a lot of experiences that were both of the paranormal, but also on the heavenly side. And I had a lot of experiences of visions and dreams that felt very real of angels and even Jesus that came to me before they even spoke to me about it. And very frequently, these I'd have these dreams where angels would come and actually say that Jesus, Jesus sent me and he wants to know if you're okay. And they were speaking about the environment, the spirituality in the environment. And they would come and say, you know, Jesus sent to say that everything is all right. He's protecting you. And I was, so I'm seeing both the positive and the negative, but these, these dreams would come. And my grandmother, because of that, she found that, you know, you are a special child. And she heard those dreams. <laughs> 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 and in retrospect, I realize now that all of those things stopped when I started to learn the Bible through the Pentecostal lens. At that time, I thought I was learning about God, and all of it stopped. In retrospect, I can now see that that is when it really stopped. Because it was not it was actually learning a lens that was not allowing that to thrive now because of that it threw me into a sense of i wonder if i'm still chosen i wonder if god doesn't want to be close to me anymore especially because of the pentecostal doctrine it fosters condemnation so i felt i i, I found myself in an identity crisis from 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 childhood right because i couldn't figure out how come it was so present then jeez i'm seeing jesus in, in 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 dreams and jesus came to me in a dream just before i was four or five and told me follow me right and it threw me into this identity crisis and as a child i began to be very rebellious against the whole idea of reading the bible and, and reading the bible and following the bible fast forward to to, to, to age 17 I began to, at age 17, I actually wanted, this whole thing started for me spiritually, where I desired to, to pass an exam that my teacher told me that I was going to fail. So here in the Caribbean, we have primary, then secondary, and you have to do an exam at the end of the secondary to gain a certain amount of, let's say, credits or qualifications that an employer would look for to hire you and so if you had five out of six of those qualifications they would take you in quickly anything less than four anything less than five you're not very liable to, to, to find a job so we began the exam and just before the exam my my teacher came and she told me zane you're going to fail the exam because i was studying but i wasn't really studying i was in school and i was always just playing sports and things like that to so play badminton and table tennis and things like that a lot she told me zane you're going to fail the exam and i went home and this is what started it started off the whole responsibility spiritually for me at eight seven at around 16 17. 
She told me she was going to fill the exam, and I went home. And out of concern and fear, I decided I was going to, I'm going to fast and ask God to help me because that is what I've been taught. I'm going to fast and ask God to help me to pass this exam. And I fasted for about a day or two. I think it was a day. And in, in, in four weeks, I literally memorized the entire textbook. Now, this is, the, this is the boy who is not studying in school, playing sports. I go in the class. Most of my grades are C's, B, lower B and C's. <laughs> right? And she, she actually tells me this, and I memorize the entire textbook. Go to the exam, pass it with a one. And as soon as the exam finish, the entire book disappears from my mind. I can't remember anything in the book. <laughs> right? And those guys in school would actually sit down there and test me and say, well, no, nah, this can't be true. And they turn to this page and start to read the first line, and I'll just continue with, with the rest of the chapter. I memorize the book, the entire, all the diagrams. As soon as the exam was finished, the book just disappeared from my mind. Now, that registered for me. Like, it's, that's impossible, but it, it was possible, all right? And at around age 17 or so, in particular, is just when I desired to really begin to experience what these guys in the Bible have been reading about and being taught about, even though I was doing rebelliously to experience what these guys are about. And so I began to have, I, I remember as a Pentecostal, we were taught to believe dreams. Everything was about a dream. I talked to God and God was pretty spontaneous in a dream. And I really at that time sincerely asked God for me draw closer to him, draw me closer to him, just as we were taught in Pentecostalism. And someone came to me with a dream, it was my mother that came to me in a dream, and the person, she had a dream of somebody telling her, respond to Zin and tell him to get up every morning at this particular time at 4 o'clock and pray. So that's where it began. All right? And so I'd get up every morning at 4, and I began to have a lot of supernatural experiences. But it was never consistent. It always felt to me, and I say that, and I say it like this now, it always felt to me as though God was somewhere in Australia and I am somewhere in the Arctic. And I would have an experience here and there, but nothing that I can live in. But if something is going wrong, some, God will actually move somebody through dream or some prophetic thing to actually guide me in the area that I'm actually struggling. And it felt, it felt to me as though God was sending me a smoke signal when I'm actually wanting to walk this thing out. So now, it, w it was still, there wasn't a huge, huge gap. At least you were experiencing su the supernatural. I was experiencing the supernatural. But but you still, it was still as if God was still a good distance away. Right. And that's because it was not something that I could engage in intentionally. It was always something that took place as a byproduct. And I didn't understand what and why. Now, can you give one or two examples of one of the supernatural experiences? So, I gave it two. One one was one, one, this one in particular is one that actually came from arising at four o'clock. And at four o'clock, I'd actually, when the time comes, after a while, I would actually, because through the consistency at four o'clock, I was very kind of militant about it. So at four o'clock, I'm getting up and I'm praying. And after a while, when the time came, when the times, the moments came or the, the occasions came where I would want to not get up at four, I'd have experiences where like, actually like in a dream, I'd get dreams in particular where somebody runs up to me in a white space. They run up to me and they say, hey, get up. God coming to see you. All right? I, there was things along that line, like there, like 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 that, and then it became physically experienced. 
So the time would come, and as soon as the time was coming, and I'm not getting up at four, like I feel like I want to sleep because I didn't really take the responsibility to go to sleep early the night before. Literally, I had one where, well, I shouldn't say one. I had experiences where when the time comes, something literally, physically shook my bed, mm. like vibrate, and I swear it was an earthquake. Another experience like that where the puss, uh, when the time was coming, I felt in the spirit while I'm sleeping, I knew that somebody approached the bed. It didn't see no bright light or anything like that, but it was uh, somebody who was illumined, but not blinding. They, came, they approached the bed. I knew that they approached the bed, and they took their finger and touched my knee. Mm. And the whole bed got hot as though there was a fire under the bed. I literally flew off the bed and started to pat down the bed to see where the fire was. And when I came to myself, I realized there was no fire and the bed was not hot. I had another experience where um, the time was coming and I saw Jesus in front of me. And he floats in front of me with his hands open to me. And as soon as he reaches in front of me, a hand grabbed my shirt and pulled me up from a lying position and curled my feet under me to sit down on the bed. And I awakened saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Not knowing that I was putting up in, in that certain position. But I felt when the, when the shirt lifted and my head rocked back with the person pulling me forward. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So those are like some of the experiences that I had that were few and far in between. It was there taking place as a byproduct. And outside of that, I had an experience where in my job in particular, I dealt with a lot of um, it's, uh, 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 it was occupational health and safety, so I dealt with um, training people to fight fires escape helicopters that, that ditch in the water and so on. And one day, I actually, this is after this period because it was, let's say in 2005, that I actually dedicated my time to wanting to get this understanding or to work with God like this. In 2006, I I'd, I'd finally found a job. And this was the job that I actually entered, uh, stepped into. And around that time, I didn't really have the time to pray because the job was very demanding physically. Right? If I'm not fighting fires, I'm standing up on a pool deck, controlling, sinking people down in a simulator and overturning them in the water and managing the entire deck and so on. And um, one day, routine, we were actually doing a fire training. And I was supposed to go to the simulator. The simulator was on fire. I was supposed to go to the simulator and open the the, the door to show persons how to approach an environment and control the oxygen that comes into the environment whilst um, whilst using substances to extinguish the fire. And one that one day I went, because it was routine, I went there just with a fire, a fire a fire hat, I had the fire gear, but on my neck. And face was exposed because I was, you know, I was actually just wearing protective glasses. Usually, we would be we'd be fully dressed with with face shields and so on and and, and things like that. And that day, I actually opened the helicopter door or the simulator and did it in a way that I usually wouldn't do it. And all I heard was boom. Mm. And fire was right around me. Like I literally looked around in the second and saw fire right around me. I was in a big ball of fire. This is not a dream, physical fire. <laughs> right? And all I heard was the instructor, who was a friend of mine. He stood up on the, on the deck and he said, Zane, oh, F. What the F you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and he ran up to me 
and literally starts to touch my face and say, you okay? You all right? Where burn? And I said, no, I didn't get burned. And he could not believe me because what they saw from on the outside was full fireball. Mm. And I stood up in this fireball and was looking at the fire right around me, but it did not come close to my clothing. It didn't, cut, it didn't touch my face, but it fully engulfed me. Right? And those are some of the experiences I had, both spiritually and on the physical now, side. Did you realize you were fully engulfed? Yeah. In the split moment, you hear the boom. I looked around in a, in a second and saw fire as far as my eyes went. And then they actually communicated to me. I, I felt a little fearful eh, because when I saw the fire, everything I have been had studied, I thought, okay, maybe this is actually going. This in that split moment, it felt like I am going to be seriously ended up in the hospital right now. That that like a flash. <laughs> <laughs> right, and after <clears throat> the instructor told me, Zane, you were literally engulfed in a massive fireball. I don't even know how you walk in here right now, right? And you're not in the hospital. And all of those things in particular, those are like a few of the experiences that I had that actually showed that God was there, but it always felt as though to intentionally engage Him. As though he's in Australia and I here, and when only when something was going to happen or something was going wrong, he would send messages. Mm. Right now, because I was actually pursuing that, because the whole Pentecostal idea was um, to get close to God, to draw close to God, and to have this visitation from God. All of the prophets locally they always talk about God visited them and God visited them. So right. I wanted that. So I was the one. If there was anybody in particular, and I always tell people this, if there's anybody in particular that is the all-star for pursuit, you're watching him right here. <laughs> right? Because I literally began to pursue this and I actually began to begin to assess what would be the requirements for God to come and visit me? So I saw how these guys in the Bible were experiencing God. And literally what I began to do was to go in the Bible. This is just in my late teens, early 20s. I'd go in the Bible and I began to take out everybody in the Bible who had some, some sort of contact with God. Made a, a, a mental list. And what I did was I thought to myself, well, these men probably experiencing this visitation from God because they're striving for, 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 for perfection. So I took them out and I began to research each one of them and find out what they knew and what they were doing. And this is where the pursuit for the identity took, more, took, took stronger precedent because the identity crisis began to began to I began to experience the identity crisis when I was no longer experiencing what I was experiencing, and at this point I really wanted it and I was really questioning. I wonder if God must move away from me and all of that. So I began to take all these guys and I began to literally study them and everything that they did. I went and learned. Right. So I began with Abraham. What did Abraham study? What did Abraham do? How did Abraham run his life? I went and studied it in the Bible. I went and studied it historically. Even look into the Quran to get extra information. So what these guys' lives were. So Abraham, Abraham historically is actually understood to be someone who is well, well, um, well educated in astronomy. So I started studying astronomy. He, had a, he, he was pretty much training soldiers also to fight. I started, to learn, I started to learn martial arts. Then I realized that most of them were built. Like Joseph. Joseph has actually mentioned in the Quran as they would throw parties for Joseph in Egypt. And it is written in the Quran that a woman... The virgins in Egypt would actually come to 
come to Joseph and they said that he was physically built. And Persians, the Persian poets actually say that he was beautiful. And the woman in Egypt said that he had to be an angel because of his physique. So I, I get into bodybuilding. So I sort of take everything that they knew and I started to study it. And that's actually how I ended up in the pursuit of trying to understand the Bible through these various fields, but also trying to build an identity to gain my visitation. Now I've got to say, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so you were literally throwing yourself into their characters yes yes sir i was doing that literally i literally took everything that they learned and i went and studied what all of them studied now Daniel. did you start having more supernatural experiences or were you still in a dry zone it was still in a dry zone this the dry zone here was drier actually so, so for for lack of a better term uh, stealing their personalities and their personality traits didn't right. help it didn't help one bit <laughs> <laughs> all it did was give me more library because i'm studying all of these different things put me in a position where, okay, I started bodybuilding. I, I was actually moved from my weight at five foot 10 was 119 to 20 pounds. And I moved from bodybuilding in about, through bodybuilding in about nine months. To, no, no, I would say in about 18 months, I moved from 120 to 190 training with persons who knew what they were about. So, right? they, so they were, you put on massive, massive amounts of muscle. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. but I, I, so, I, so trying to copy someone else does not work. If you're looking for spiritual manifestation, that is definitely not going to do it. It will give you physical results, but with the mental exhaustion. Because after a while, it became mentally exhausting. Because whilst everybody is training in the gym, because they want to look good on the beach, in my mind, I'm actually trying to get this physique that I've spoken about concerning Joseph so that God will visit me. I'm studying all of this so that God would one day come and say, Zin, you please me with your perfection <laughs> and come and visit me in my room. You know, my room should be done in fire. Something, something. I'm just looking for this. <laughs> and which so many people do this. That, well, that is exactly what I'm saying. If you're looking for the all-star, look me right here. Because I did the 10 hours and 12 hours of prayer a day in pursuing this in 2005. You did, did the fasting thing. I did the fasting. I did the week, the all weekend reading the Bible and praying. I, I was studying it. I was studying how it works through the Pentecostal lens. So I read various books on spirituality. In addition, this is in addition to all of the books that I've been studying on astronomy and different fields that I've been studying to try to gain this persona of perfection. And in all of that, the experiences were there, but still at that phase, this is 15 years from 17 to 32. I am pursuing this relentlessly, looking for this visitation, right? And I didn't even know what I was just doing is building a library. That's my, no, my, my intellect is filled with all of these things. I can fight. I spent 13 years studying Chinese martial arts. <laughs> I could dance. I danced two years professional salsa. I'm a step into bodybuilding, I build a physique. So people see me, I saw me. I, I, um, saw me then, and it's like, wow. So the dancing <laughs> part, I'm assuming that was David? That was David. <laughs> okay. I'm right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just started to tick off the list. <laughs> All right? So if you're looking for the all-star, brother, I'm right here. <laughs> no. Wow. 
I mean, you truly went after the extreme there. Yes. Because in my mind, that's how most likely it, it worked. These guys, because you look at these guys in the Bible and you're seeing while they're walking with God, so they had to be perfect because you're taught that God is this perfect, infinite God. So you think, okay, God probably respect their perfection and they're striving for, 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 for perfection. And this is what I went after. So would the five-year-old Zane had thought that? No. Not at all. And Not that's at all. when that's when you were experiencing both sides. Yes, sir. Both sides. From from roughly five-ish to seventeen or so. No, from that literally took place between four and let's say six or seven. Okay. Around seven is where I started to learn the Bible, and that's when it stopped happening in the way it was happening. Okay. So, like from seven right back to 17, I was being taught the Bible from my parents and things like that. And that's when it went down. That's when it went down. Okay. All right. So that way everybody's got a clear picture of that. And then from around 17 is where you went on this right. extraordinary <laughs> journey. Yeah. Of becoming Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> well, Bruce we... Lee. <laughs> <laughs> literally it was Bruce Lee I had books that I had inherited from my dad because he studied Chinese martial arts for about two, a few years of his life so he had books on Bruce Lee and I would go through these books and I had books on all of the old Chinese characters like Alexander Fu Sheng David oh. Chiang Dave, Jackie Chan, Jit Li all of these guys and that's what I come up with right? why is everybody who's watching Sesame Street I come up watching those characters and those movies. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, let's say around 17 is when I began to pursue it. I already started bodybuilding in my early 20s because I was very, very skinny. Right? And that took its, its course. And um, fast forward now, 15 years later, I'm reaching to my father. No, not fast forward. And my father had passed when I was age 25. Now, that day is actually like registered right here because that is actually what caused me to begin to question myself and to question what I thought I knew. I studied all of this. And I prayed for people even though I'd studied all of that, especially the spiritual aspect. I was studying books that was actually written by a woman called Rebecca Brown. She's actually well known to be to have a ministry that deal with Satanists. So when I saw her, her books, I said, well, she has to know some spirituality. She didn't speak to Satanists. So I went and I began to study her literature, her stories, and the things that she learned. And I was the Pentecostal because of what I had been studying there. I would always have a flask of olive oil somewhere in a bag, somewhere or in a room or something. Right? And then one evening I left to go to go out to purchase something and upon returning I saw my mother as soon as I walked in the door my mother was in a panic mm. and she called me and she says Zane something happened to, happening to your father I don't know what it is and she's crying and when I went to him and I spoke to him she told me he can't hold anything with his hand and because I had spent years in training people to for first aid, I know I knew what checks to do, and I realized that he was having a stroke. Mm. And right then and there, I took everything that I had known and learned through the Pentecostalism, thinking that I probably had something to work with. I began to go through the lists because there was a hierarchy, you know, list of things that you could have done and all of these things and I'm asking God and going through the list one by one to him, one by one. And nothing was working. Nothing stopped. Until I got to the point of holding his head, he was sitting on a chair and I hold his head against my, my chest and I literally begged God to stop it. And it did not. 
I was in sheer fear and panic of, of losing my father. And nothing worked. And I ended up begging God. And still nothing happened. And I'm watching him in a stroke, with a stroke, sitting down there. Eventually, we didn't have a vehicle at the time. Eventually, my brother got in contact with one of the neighbors. And they turned up and we took him to the hospital. Uh, we weren't wealthy people here, so we had to go to the public hospital. And the public hospital, they don't have a, really, a very good reputation. So he was admitted 7 o'clock. They saw him after 11 in the night. Mm. We took him to the hospital. He sat down there with a stroke for four hours in the waiting room. Wow. Didn't see him until 11. And we there and he there in this stupor. And naturally, we are there in panic, in fear. My mother crying consistently, watching him there. And she don't know him like that. He was healthy. I don't know him like that. And eventually they, they took him in, so that he was he experienced a stroke. And the next day, we get a phone call from the hospital saying that he passed. Now that right there was the first blow to everything that I had been taught, everything I had learned. But I wanted to question, or my question was, why God didn't do it? Why God didn't do something? Right, and when he passed, I didn't even have time to grieve because the entire family was thrown. He was at the pillar of the family, and the entire family was thrown in a uh, in chaos. I literally had to be the pillar, so I actually had to manage my emotions to stand up to be the pillar there for my mother, who for two and three years later couldn't catch herself. She was just crying randomly, no matter where she was. Right? A year later, now that, I said I couldn't grieve, so I actually had to try and find answers for myself. And the most, the most the church said is that they use a scripture in the Bible that says that God takes those who belong to him when evil is coming. There's a scripture in Isaiah that speaks about that. And so we're using that to say, well, probably evil is coming and God took him. A year later, his mother, which is my grandmother, had an experience where she was like in the late 70s, got sick, came out with a fever, we admitted her to the hospital, came back home in the hospital, and she was someone who was praying three times a day, like her soul there. She couldn't walk. And the church told her, you know, have faith in God. You need to have faith for, for, for to be healed. And she was praying three times a day. Tony, she got to the point of death. And where everybody was saying, well, she had to be religious and so she making it. She began to complain of, of seeing heat and fire. In an incoherent state. Mm. And I, that's where I started a question, what the heck are we following? Because if we say if what we're saying is, is, is the truth, why is she experiencing that? So I asked my mother to go and say the sinner's prayer with her. And as soon as she said it, the woman just went into peace. She called me to the bed, holding her hand to my hand strongly, like she knew that she was going to die. Held to my hand strongly and reminded me of a dream that my parents had when I was born. That's a separate conversation. And said, remember that you are here to do something. Do not get distracted. Mm. The following morning, she passed. That started to play with my mind, but I couldn't even show my family that. Because now I'm questioning, what the hell are we following? Next two years, my aunt, which is my which is would have been my father's um, sister-in-law, she came down with cancer. I saw church leaders come in and out of that room. I even went and prayed with her. Nothing happened, and she had a demising battle with cancer. And some things happened that really caused me to question if this, if what we're talking about 
if it's from God or from Satan itself, because of the things that happened there. But just to protect the privacy of the family, I'm not going to be talking about that. So I know got thrown into this perspective where if that could happen to them, it could happen to me too. So what the heck we following? Is there any truth to this? And I began to question, but I don't know where to go, who to talk to. I got to throw this in. How in the world did you not become an atheist like me? <laughs> well, that's on, the, that's on the way to the story. That's, that, that's on the next part of the story here. Because at age 25, that happened seven years later. That takes me to, to 2014. And in 2014, when my father died, I had to step up on the plate and take care of all the expenses. And I was, they, were taught, they taught us the, the perspective that, well, if you live right, God will bless you. And if you give your tithes, God will bless you. So I went and studied the tithe system. And I realized, yeah, yeah if you miss your tithes, you have to give double tithes. You know? I, Tony, I went into all of that. And saw no finances reach me. Right. And then one day, a, fam a friend of the family who, who is actually who functioned with a ministry in the United States, she, she, she identifies as a prophetess. She sends me a message from God. And God, she message from God was, you're not putting God first. God say you're not putting him first. And I flip a switch. I went into rage because <laughs> I am questioning myself. What the hell are you talking to me about? I am not putting God first when I have questions that, I, that nobody could answer apparently. Six years dedicated to my family because I'm taught if I actually bless them, God will bless me. So I'm doing it with my blessing. I'm struggling to maintain the financial equilibrium. I have questions. I still still read my Bible, still praying, but I still actually have the responsibilities of the expenses of the home, my family, my mother, and all of that. And you sending me a message saying, I'm not putting you first? Well, boy, I flip a switch one afternoon. Mm -hmm. Right in front of my mother. My mother got scared because she is a devout woman. Right? And she got scared. She says, Zane, you shouldn't be saying these things. Don't, don't, don't say that, Zane. And I did really listen to God and I say, you are a flipping liar. I say, you are a liar. I do know all this. Where the heck? Where you say it is? And that was the first time I got to the point where I literally told my mother that day, I said, look, it's better I leave all this God nonsense and go change my life, get a woman, drink a little alcohol with everybody else, make myself comfortable. Because this is SHIT. <laughs> right? Cow dung. <laughs> so this whole God business is bulls. Is bull. Right? Now, right at that time, the following day, my eldest sister called me to do something. And... I had to borrow her vehicle the night before. The night, the day before, I had the vehicle in my, at hand. That was the evening before. The, the same evening, I threw this, I flipped the switch. I just went into this rage. Went to sleep, parked the vehicle outside in my yard. Went to went to went to sleep and get up next morning and realize they break into the vehicle and clean it out. Mm. So the first thought that comes to my mind is that I spoke to God and I gained punished. So I said, Lord, so I said, I repent. <laughs> right? I said, Father, I repent. I'll speak again, see and things like that and all of that. Fast forward now, an opportunity comes for me to go to Colombia. And I go to Colombia. Um, just randomly Google a church just before I went to Colombia. I went to Colombia for one month in, in December of 2014. Went to Colombia. Visit this church. And Tony is the first time in my life I walk into the church and I could tangibly feel a difference that it brought tears to my eyes. 
walk into the church and the service starts, the pastor only talking about the Holy Spirit. And everybody starts to get healed. So the, for, the, for the first time in my life, I seen people getting off our wheelchairs. I seen, I seen open wounds healing. And a bunch of different things. People actually lining up Tony. The man not asking for money. And people lining up to give the church money. And as they give, they're coming back with testimonies. So now, if I had questions, now I'm watching this and I'm saying, if this is God in Colombia, who the heck are you talking to all my life? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm literally standing and I'm watching this thing and I am flabbergasted. I'm there like, what the hell? Now, are you angry or hopeful? Which side of that spectrum are you on? Because I am. At least you're actually seeing something supernatural. Right. Right. So it wasn't anger as yet. <laughs> it didn't reach there yet. <laughs> Neither was it hope. I felt lost. I felt like this. I don't know what the heck am I? Because if what I know is wrong and my identity is based on what I know, then my identity had to be wrong. So I fell into what most people would call mental health issues. But in my mind, I didn't see it as mental health because I accustomed living in even my profession in an in a industry that taught me responsibility for safety, make sure and make decisions, find out what's the problem, and start to actually act on it to, 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 to create the environment that you need to create for people to work safely. So that's something that was technically ingrained into me. So whilst everybody would say they're in mental health issues, I actually identified it that I was in an identity crisis and I need to find what the hell my identity is because this is all I like. So I went to one-on-one -on -one meeting to the same church that a big crusade in a big park. Right, a park called the Park of Simon Simon Bolivar, or the Parque de Simon Bolivar. In this park, and this man, you can see him this small on big screens, and this man blessed the crowd. And every time he blessed the crowd, I feel a wave hit my chest, mm. and I am there feeling like I want to cry. And at the same time, I'm confused. Like if this is God here. What the hell am I talking to? Who have I been talking to all along? Because this man obviously is demonstrating evidence. And where is everybody else? And what have I been taught? So January of 2015, I touched back down in Trinidad and Tobago. Totally out of it, Tony. Because I'm reasoning to myself, if this is God in Colombia, who am I speaking to? And if this is wrong, then my identity wrong. I don't know what the hell am I? I am now in a graver identity crisis. It is in, the graver, in, in a graver stage. Right? And I actually got to the point of questioning myself, and I literally sat down and I thought to myself, I said, look, is either all of this God thing is a lie, and the Bible is a lie? Or I said, this bag of diamonds that we think we have in our hand filled with glass. And I need to find what the hell in the, in the bag is the glass. Now, I sat down and I had to remember age four to six. Tony, that is the only reason I decided I was going to give this one more shot. And this time I was going to put a practical empirical criteria to it, like a scientific criteria to it, actual application with, for, 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 for evidence. If I didn't have those experiences at age four to six and I did not experience that in Colombia, I would have walked away saying this Bible is a lie as most people do when they get to that point. Because you don't have any other thing to, to compare it, your, your, your experience to compare to. And plus, I'm a translator. By, that's my first profession, right? And as a translator, we, as you're speaking more than one language, you, can on, you have a, a grasp of different ways of thought, different system of thinking, because your language teaches you how to think, basically. It, it guides your, your thinking process. So I said, I'm going to thought, maybe the translation is wrong. 
So I literally put a pause on my profession in 2015. Didn't go back to my profession. Even if I went back, Tony, I couldn't fight fires in that state. I would zone out. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't control people going down in a pool, being trained to escape helicopters, somebody would drown. I just was not in that state. I lost my strength, my, my anchor. And I felt like I was in the middle of the ocean and there was not a branch. So to change it, I decided I'm going to put an empirical criteria to this. And people might think, hey, Zayn is very altruistic. And he's, he thinks about these things. No, that was Zayn looking for his identity. So I began to pursue it. Put the profession on pause and I went at it with 90, at 90. So I decided to see the same time I would actually have attribute to work. I was working eight hours a day. I decided I would take the same system and put it on my to this research. And so I took the Bible and I started to apply the translator's lens with it to it. In 2015, March, so I actually was listening to, to Pete Cabrera just the year before I went to Colombia. I came back. And I'm listening to him, but he is speaking, was speaking some things, but he wasn't being very clear. Like, he's not really telling you outrightly. And then he mentioned Curry Blake. So I actually went to Curry Blake, and that's how I ended up finding Curry Blake. Listen to Curry Blake, and I, as I began the research, Curry Blake came in two months after in the, into the research. I now started the research. And I was supposed to be 10 hours a day. I ended up doing 16 to 20 hours a day, Tony. Just going through scriptures and scrutinizing it, finding the mechanical translation to find if it is actually true, if the actual English translation is true. <clears throat> encountered Curry Blake, his DHT. When he encountered it, at first, the first time I saw him, Tony, I wrote him off as a heretic. I say this man is heresy. Right? <laughs> the only reason I turned back to Curry Blake was a few days later, I actually gathered together with the family that had asked me to do a Bible study with them. And that moment I sat around the table, in the place that I sat around it, I realized I dreamt the occasion five years before. Mm. And in the five years that I dreamt it, Corey Blake's face came up in the dream. And because it felt like a deja vu, and I, I, rel I relived the dream, that's the only reason I say, okay, probably God want me to listen to this man. If it wasn't for that, I write off Corey Blake. Because I'm all the Pentecostal teaching. So I started to listen to Curry, And Curry started to say everything contrary to what the Pentecostal is saying. I went through that DHT. That's an 18-hour training course. I went, to, went away six times. Walked outside. Looking for somebody, and then soon again the opportunity. I lay hands on somebody using his his content, and boom, person get healed. Tony, that was like the first time since I was six years of age. I feel like I get a fresh, a better fresh air, and this was not all a lie. Then after that, I was actually doing some things, and I got injured. In it, uh, she had some experiences, and I got injured around the experience also. And some other experiences, about four or five experiences, and I got healed for all five. And I say, okay, then there's something here. And so I began now to search the Bible to see if the translation was right. Between 2015 to 2017, Tony, let's say up to 2016, I went through 11 versions of the Bible, looking to see if the translation was wrong. And I realized that there was no, everybody looking for the perfect translation. There was no perfect translation. Is that every translator has a, an emphasis or a priority when they're right. in their translation. So I realized all these translations serve a purpose. There's no, no, no perfect translation. So what it ended up happening now is that as fast as I'm studying and I'm, I'm scrutinizing the translations, I put in um, experiments every day at 12 noon. And on the weekend, I had more than one time on the weekend. But every day at 12 noon, I stop and we experimenting for at least two hours. 2015, 2016, nothing is working but Curry Blake information. But his information to me was not consistent. Like, it was working, but then it didn't work. And right. then one, one day I sat down and I talked. <laughs> now, at the end of 2016, I come to the realization, this is not right. And this is wrong. 
So at the end of 2016, I turned away from the Westernized perspective. I stopped listening to pastors, to TBN, to anybody, any church leader. I stopped listening to you because this is now six to seven hundred experiments in no manifestation, only Corey Blake work, working, right? In 2017, I turned to the Jews, to the rabbis, started listening to the rabbis and realized, well, wait now. Well, the rabbis saying something different from the Christians. But as I'm listening to them, they still have some Christian westernized abstract perspectives that they're mixing into it. So after about six to eight months, almost 10 months listening to rabbis, because I was studying them, eh? studying what they're studying and listening to what they're saying listen to so many rabbis and rabbis laughing at christians by the way most believers most christians don't know that rabbis are laughing at them because they come up with the whole trinity theory the whole idea of all of these different perspectives that they have of satan and demons and things running them down rabbis are literally laughing at them because the rabbis from the rabbi's perspective who are you all to come and take our literature and interpret it. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> so in 2017, I'm reaching down to 2017, at the end of 2017, having now two and um, two and three quarter years behind me, the westernized doctrine not working, the rabbi is saying, but they mix up with all these things, and I'm thinking, we need to go back. Now, as a translator, I'm saying that after going through 11 versions, and coming to the point of understanding, okay, this is wrong, it's not working, then I turn to the point that as, as a translator, I say, well, there's, there's two things going on here. Maybe the translation is correct, but the translator did not communicate the philosophy of the thought. Because it's one thing to translate what somebody is saying, is another thing to communicate what they intend to say. And translation is a science that grew over time. So like today, if you read the Bible, the translators translate names. Today, you don't do that in translation. Right. Because once, once you change the name, you change the character. And that worked against believers because when they change the names, they lost the context of the function of the name in the text. And so everybody's saying the Lord, which is owner of land, instead of Yahweh, which is to be self-existent. All right? So I realized I need to go back to the philosophy of the language. The philosophy of the language here has to be the, has to be the problem. Now, I don't the doctor naturally lens of a translator. So I turn now to the ancient Hebrews. And I go back to Moses and start to study his, his civilization. Now, there's a list of literature that I went through that is listed on our website that actually contributed. And some of them are still not mentioned there because a list of books I went through to get that information. Plus, I encountered the ancient Hebrew Research Center. So in any case, I started to study that, and then things started to make sense. And then in 2018, coming on the end of 2017, early 2018, I sat down and I thought to myself, if everybody working with morality here and nothing working, then immorality had to be wrong. And I sat down and I said to myself, Tony, I said, if God is really the God of the entire universe, and the garden's consistent about everything reproducing after its own kind. And the universe is working by what science calls in the laws of physics. Then it has to be that these men tap into, tap into some law of physics. Because they're living in different spaces. They, they ain't talking to each other. They're studying the same literature. Which means this Torah has to be communicating some principle. That nobody is taking the time to actually identify. And in the westernized world, we're treating it like a moral system. Mm. And, we, and we're actually treating it as like God have a, a personality that he could compromise here and in the compromise in there. I was over the, the, the morality. I was, I could take the morality and burn it in the backyard for like here. I just thought to myself, if this all of this showing here, laws of physics, and everything reproducing after its own kind, then this, this, this script here has to be talking about a law of physics. And sometimes, just like the Wright brothers who, who invent planes, they discovered the law of aerodynamics. It was always there, just that nobody identified it. And so I thought to myself, if that 
works like that, then it has to be there's a principle that is meant to happen into. And so I began now to revisit the entire scriptures to look for the principle. And then one day I'm actually going through Psalms, Psalm 1, and it says the law of the Lord. And I start to look at, I know law is Torah, the Lord is Yahweh. Then I look at Torah and I realize the Torah means precepts, and then it click. Precept is principle. So this is the, the, the law of the Lord is the principle of Yahweh, and therefore Yahweh is the self-existent and the eternal. Hmm. And boom, that is when it now comes together. And I realize, but wait, now this book has to be expressing the principle of the self-existent and the eternal. So I now revisit the scriptures and start to comb through it. And then everything started to make sense. Then we started to take that and we apply it to spirituality. And it starts to work. So manifestation moved from 5% to jump up to 17, 80% through applying the principle of the self existent I started to see much more, I started to see healings consistent, more consistently. And healing for me, healing for others. And then I started to actually experiment it with, within the creation. And I realized that the principle actually also brings you into synchronicity with the creation. So we can move animals, we can change the weather, right. we can actually cause weather patterns, stop weather patterns, because the principle is actually how it works. Right? So that then eventually led to the birth of the International Institute of, Institute of, of, of Pneumatology in 2019. It was officially registered. And so all of that research in some total was actually started to be disseminated through the institute and that also gave us the understanding of how your spirit works the human energy so we can now begin to redefine life not just for spiritual manifestation for healing and for all of these different things but to have dominion and also to actually redefine life so that you could actually live the divine life and know how to because religion teaches you how not to but they don't tell you how yep. to and that in some total is actually how we are here today. So over the period of that time and unpacking the principle, we've actually been able to understand the scriptures and now understand the, the scriptures perfectly and be able to communicate it. So what I what we do now is really translate that to the Westerner from their mindset. And that's really my my way I come in, translating the concept after taking on the concept for my own. Now, through that process, when I found the principle, the first person that, were, that, that was in contact with it was me. So I began to take it on as my own. I took on, and that led me to the priesthood because I, then we realized that the priesthood was the, was the template for sonship. So I pulled apart the priesthood and started to take it on as my own, 24-7, literally. And when we started to study the priesthood and started to walk all the priesthood, Tony dies when things started to get paranormal. Things started to move in the room. The spirit was in the technology all over the place. I mean, when I say, like, I haven't had experiences where I'm sitting by a window. At that point in time, I had gotten to the point of understanding that the spirit and your mind are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And I sat down by the window, window blowing on my computer. Just thought to myself that I, I will have to close the window because I need to go take a bath. Tony, I just gave the thought, looked to close the window, and the window was shut. I didn't even know when the window closed. Right. I didn't even notice when the curtain stopped blowing. Those kind of things started to happen. And through that understanding, the spirit started to actually manifest in the technology. Like literally, I would be on my phone, which is what I started off all this research on it, on my phone before I got a laptop because of my budget. And the spirit would literally, sometimes I'll be reading the Bible and want to know what that means. And there were times where the spirit will zoom out the Bible app, zoom open the, the dictionary, the Bible dictionary, pull up the word Tony and scroll along the definition that I want and stop. People may not believe that. I believe it. <laughs> but it began to be like that. And that's how we realized that what we were taught now 
and what the Bible is really talking about is totally unrelated. Take everything you think you know, throw it in the garbage. Throw it away and, throw and start it over. Throw it all away. Um, start over. You know, now, of course, people are well aware of, we have a different way of explaining it, yeah. but it's the same principle. It is the same principle. And that's <laughs> what I love about our collaboration. <laughs> Amen, for real. So do I. We're all ba we are basing off the same principle, which is why it is like so falls into place perfectly. Right. right. Yet, it's just simply our perspectives are different. You come from the ancient Hebrewic mindset. Right. Where I come from, honestly, just trusting the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Everything to me has always been about the Holy Spirit inside of me, right. even when I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. Right, right, right. Yeah. As all about reliance upon Him. Mm -hmm. um, I love, and now me and you, if I remember right, we would have met like 2015 or 16, right? Yeah. Yes. Right around that when you first, it was very close when you first started out with the Curry Blake. If I remember okay. right. Right, right, right. Um, so I love it. I love the fact that you can tell when everything started whoosh. Yeah. When you got the boom in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because when I did it, I did it for my personal identity. And by the way, studying the priesthood. And understanding how the priest would take on the name is what brought the cataclysmic change. Is what taught me that our understanding of the name was super limited. And it's really about, as you put it, trusting the spirit, but also assimilating the identity of Christ. Right. And once it started to function from there. As what I even mentioned in our session last night in the New Covenant Basics, I was actually saying it's not what you're saying, it's who is speaking. That's what it comes down to. It's not what's coming out of your mouth. It's not what's coming out of your mouth. Right. It's whose mouth is it coming out of. And that identity is a covenantal identity that nobody teaches in our culture. And it doesn't even have to be words coming out of our mouth. It it's doesn't actually even have to be what words. What is coming from our core? I have actually demonstrated in practical sessions that I don't do publicly because I don't need the naysayers and your perspectives. I only deal with people who are serious and really want to know. I have shown in, 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 um, in, in those sessions, Tony, that you do not have to speak to heal. Right. What your mouth is to your physical body, your thoughts are to your spirit. Yes. And all you need to do is to think it. Yes. And it begins to manifest. Yes. I've, I've healed a person like that in demonstrating it. I've even seen, have had person's limbs go out without even thinking. Sorry, without even speaking, just right. thoughts. And it, when, it, when it comes down to it, I always tell people now where I'm standing. The only reason I say in the name of Jesus publicly is that so people know that I am not a witch. When things start to happen, they will not assume that I'm a witch. I'm representing Jesus. Because they could easily say that. <laughs> because the church, Tony, Westernized Christianity, they talk about God's supernatural power so much, but they don't really don't believe it. And when they see it, their first instinct is, attribute, is to attribute it to the devil. Right. I'm sure you had that experience. Oh, yes. <laughs> they speak about it like it's a morally good thing to talk about but when they really encounter it 
When it will, really happens. They will call you a devil. They yes. will call you a witch. Oh, yes. I had a, at one specific church, the pastor, the elder, and, and I think you know this story. When the, when the amputated leg grew back. Right. I remember that. Uh, the pastor of that church, all the elders of the church, literally turned their backs on myself and the fellows whose leg grew back. Wow. See what I'm saying? Literally. See what they I'm saying? They stood right there. I, w I walked him up. I want him to give that testimony. And they literally turned around, would not even look at us. So, yes, I know that well, holy brother Zane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they talk about it as though it's a nice, morally good thing to, to say and talk about. Now, the times I was saying the name of Jesus, well, actually, let me reverse that. Right. The times I won't say in the name of Jesus is just to piss off the religious folk. <laughs> when I know they're religious. Right. <laughs> because more than likely, I've already told my testimony. Right, 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 right. I've already declared I'm a believer. Right, I'm not right. a Christian. I'm a believer. Yes, sir. I fully grasp that. And then I won't say in the name of Jesus. And even though they get healed, their heads be steaming. Yeah. Because yeah. I didn't say in the name of Jesus. <laughs> It, uh, it doesn't, you know, if we think it's a theological necessity, then it isn't. Yeah. And so many people use the name of Jesus without the belief that dishonors the name. Wow. Well said. Well articulated. Well articulated. Yes, brother. That right there. That right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, because even from a scriptural perspective, most believers never consider this because they don't know the scriptures. They don't know the scriptural paradigm. The Bible literally says that Jesus' blood sanctified you. Mm -hmm. for the name to dwell in you. Most believers run around saying here, I have this sickness and I have this sickness and I have that sickness. And what you do not realize is that you are showing a lack of reverence yes. to the blood that purchased you. That you and the body. The, 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 I'm talking about the blood that sanctified the body and all of that. <laughs> You're showing a lack of reverence to the blood that sanctified the body mm -hmm. and your spirit, your mind, your soul, sanctified you, that you assume the authority to put a title that comes from what is understood as Satan to what is purchased by God. You are literally disrespecting the name, disrespecting and technically and you are on the brink of insulting the Holy Spirit because it's the, the law of the scripture is that every spirit reproduces thoughts after its own kind. Can. So if you're running around here and you take what the doctor says and you attribute that to yourself, technically you're disrespecting the blood that was shed. You're disrespecting the Holy Spirit. You're very close to blasphemy, of the, to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit just as did the Pharisees that said, what you're doing is Satan, but they knew better. Your ignorance is what actually causing you to do that and not actually take and actually not suffer the consequences for what you're doing. Because that name is holy, it's sanctified, and it's dwelling in a vessel that has been sanctified. 
So the mere fact that you walking around and saying, I have this sickness, yeah. and I have this disease, and you're actually wielding that name, and as you put it, I put in what we're putting this together, and actually not having the faith and trust that's supposed to accompany that. If you had known better, you would be guilty of blasphemy. Right. Literally. And that is not the writer of Hebrews says, if God could treat it that seriously in the old, much more now that his own, his own son went through that to get you here and dies what you're doing? No. So what you just said there, I think we need to take that and put it up on our banner, brother. There you go. <laughs> Make sure you write it down. <laughs> say it again. No, I'm serious. I won't put that on our, on our image. Say, say it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That those that speak the name of Jesus. Uh -huh. at, at least we got on recording. Yeah. <laughs> Those that speak the name of Jesus without believing the name are dishonoring the body of Jesus or the name. What I said before was better. Holy Spirit, bring it back. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is our that is our true statement. Nice, I have it here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that is that is straight talk, there, brother. That is straight talk right there. <laughs> well, I've certainly enjoyed this time. That uh. That's huge. A lot, some of that I knew. I knew the okay. general, the general scope. Okay. This is the first time I've really heard your details. Okay. Um, so I love it. And in Jesus' name, I'm speaking every single person that's listening. Takes religion, dumps in the trash can. You're healed. Now move on with your life as who you truly are. Amen. All right. All right. So I guess we wrap it up here. I think we need to wrap her up. All right. So to everyone, we want to thank you for actually tuning in to the Miraculous Gospel of Healing podcast with Tony Myers and Zian Pierre. You know where to find us. Take a look at the details on the screen. And of course, in our outro, you will also have those details. Blessings and much love, and see you all on the next episode. Boom. And bam. Yeshua. <laughs>